Welcome to the podcast today. My name is Douglas Gabriel. I'm here with John Barnwell. And today we're going to be discussing one of the most exciting things that has happened in our work uh, here. And it is a series that we're putting together that I have written along with uh, help from my beautiful wife. And also John has been editing and proofreading them. So John, welcome to the show. And thank you for all your efforts in this uh, new project that we're on. Yeah, I, uh, I'm honored to, to be taken to the task. You know, as you and I both know, we've been at this for 45, 50 years or so together uh, going back and forth. And so it's only natural. This is so exciting because people have gotten uh, very excited about these books and we have yet to do the videos. So we're gonna do a video, two videos on this. And basically, as the other books come out, we'll do two videos. One will be kind of an introduction, and the other one will be a deep, deep dive into the subject. Now, this book is out, and it's called The Incarnation of Araman, The Occult Annihilation of the Soul from the Works of Rudolf Steiner. And uh, I'm very, very happy with this book. Now, we're going to explain a little bit uh, how these things came about, what this project is about uh, up front, and then we will discuss the topic. And the reason that this topic was chosen as the first book, because there's a bunch of these books, and some of these topics are all on what I call hot topics in anthroposophy, but why is it that I would have chosen the incarnation of Araman, the occult annihilation of the soul, to be the very first book to go out to get people thinking about this subject? John, you want to say something about that? Well, uh, the obvious example is the times in which we live. And uh, there's a, a, a short line from Steiner where he says, and it's from his uh, the cosmic prehistoric ages of mankind back in uh, September uh, of 1918. And he says, in man's social life, there is nothing so much hated by Lucifer as anything that smells at all of law. Araman, which would be like Satan, Araman would like to have laws, inscribe laws everywhere. And so that's what we're looking at in the current state of affairs is that there's this whole attempt to have this technocracy unfold before our eyes to where we're literally uh, fined if we don't have our phone with us so they know where we are. This is exactly what Rudolf Steiner pointed out. And, and we're going to get into those details because there is so much confusion out there on the internet, in anthroposophical circles, even in the society. You have different books that say different things about this. And yet Rudolf Steiner said it's one of the most important things that we should learn how to get a perspective on in our age. Well, let's talk about this series. Why is there a new series that uh, Tyler and I and you are helping on coming out called From the Works of Rudolf Steiner? because most people will tell you what Steiner says, but they won't give you his words. So we have created basically study guides and the study guides will give you his words, let you come up with your own opinion about what those words mean, but then also we're adding commentary and basically putting it in perspective so that you can understand it. And also, unfortunately, there's 378 books of Rudolf Steiner you'd have to go through and there are over 500 specific references to Ar uh, to Araman and Araman's incarnation. So you would have to go through almost 400 books, get 500 quotes, put them together, and then say, now, what does this mean? Because remember, we're translating Steiner from German into English, and the translators sometimes aren't very good. And so you can, as far as I'm concerned, until I hear him say it, Rudolf Steiner say something two, three times, I'm not going to believe one translation, and I'm not going to believe hearsay. And that's what most of the Araman and the incarnation of Araman speculation is based upon hearsay. So we're creating these books, and essentially what will ultimately happen is that these books will be part of something that anyone can use as a self-study to really become a student of Rudolf Steiner's. And you could call that anthroposophy, but I'd rather call it spiritual science. And so these books are basically self-help books because the old mysteries are gone. The new mysteries are here, but the new mysteries are based upon doing it yourself. This is a, 
uh, pay-as-you-go kind of system. You have to do the work yourself. Going to an anthroposophical guru is not going to help you. Going to a guru is not going to help you. Unfortunately, going to many churches of the many types there are may not help you. But if you take the works of the greatest clairvoyant in modern history, Rudolf Steiner, who was also the greatest spiritual scientist, whose prophecies and predictions and indications have come true to the letter. So when he says things about the incarnation of Araman, then you need to take it seriously because it's such an important topic of our age. But we need, need to first probably give you a perspective. When you say evil to someone who's a believer in the Bible, they're going to say, well, there's Satan. And then someone else might say, well, what about Mephistopheles? Someone else might say, well, what about uh, Christ's reference in the references in the Bible to Mammon, the god of money, the god of evil, of materialism? Who are these different demonic beings? And how would that impact the human being in the modern age? So generally, the anthroposophist will tell you the following. There's Lucifer on your left, Araman on your right. Lucifer is in front of you, Araman's behind you. Lucifer is above you, Araman's below you. So any way you turn, you're going to see this polarity and realize there's a spectrum of experience for the human being. But in the middle, you're going to have Christ. So the problem is, if you start to look into what Rudolf Steiner says about these things, it's going to have to take you back to what's called the school of unlearning. You need to unlearn most of the things you've ever been told. Why? Because they're a specific perspective that was locked in time, could be ancient times, even could be modern times. But the point is they're locked into the view of the particular age and they don't necessarily apply in today's age. So John, what can you tell us about you know, this balance between Lucifer and Araman, which is really the key to understanding spiritual development? Yeah, the first thing that I tried to address in my first book, uh, The Arcana of the Grail Angel, is the whole idea of the quest. And spiritual science or anthroposophy is a quest. It's a quest for the Holy Grail. And so what does that mean? Well, when you get into understanding that it's very important not to over-conclude, not to... to uh, follow the temptation of closure. You know, you want to get the answer. And that's the thing that we keep time and time again trying to remind people is that the significance of certain uh, supersensible impulses changes throughout history. And that's the most important thing to keep in mind. It also changes regarding in, in what continent or what culture uh, it's uh, involved. And so you have to be very fluid in your thinking. In fact, it's something that, that's easier for women, Rudolf Steiner says, than for men to be able to have that fluidity and not get overly rigid in your concepts. And so it's important to just keep an open set. Yes. And so when people say, you know, the devil, or they say Satan. What does that mean when the book of uh, Revelation to St. John the Divine in what we call the apocalypse talks about the um, seven-headed, ten-horned dragon that comes out of the sea? Who is that? Is that different than the beast with two horns? Is it different than what we would say is Satan? These are the things that Rudolf Steiner has made perfectly clear. And the confusion is quite easy to understand because in the past, it was really the influence of Lucifer in the far, far past that in essence took what was natural clairvoyance and helped the human learn how to think about these things instead of have a direct sensory experience of them. So natural clairvoyance in the past was in fact somewhat of a gift of the fallen highest angel, Lucifer. So we know in the Bible, the story of Lucifer is before the throne of God and Michael is given the sword of heaven and strikes the stone from his crown and Lucifer and the stone fall to earth. The stone is the Holy Grail, as John has referred to. But Lucifer came down from heaven first because he was the one who brought 
sensory impressions. And Rudolf Steiner pointed out that we were supposed to be created only to the material level of a fragrance, almost somewhat like a vapor. But because of Lucifer's fall, matter congealed in a much different way. And we now see the color of the world. We see things in the outer world because of the gift of the light bearer, Lucifer. Now, most people will think, oh, no, 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 no. Lucifer is completely evil. You can't talk about Lucifer without saying he's 100% evil. No, even demons can be redeemed. And they may, as John has just pointed out, the key factor is what's called heterochrony, which we've spoken about before in Akashic Talks. But the point is, is that many things are happening right now. At least three, four levels are happening at one time. And different beings are doing different things. And some of them have gotten here today by doing something three incarnations of the earth ago. And because they did it that long ago, and then over time, they didn't keep rising up the spiritual nine ranks of the hierarchy, but they got what was called, they became a laggard being or they stayed behind. And to begin with, those were mostly Luciferic beings. So if you want to confuse an anthroposophist, <laughs> ask him a few questions about these things. They'll say, where do you find Lucifer? Well, you'll find Lucifer in the astral body, in the astral light, where the angels live. And he's a, he's a fallen uh, angelic being. N that's only one perspective. Lucifer is said was the highest angel there was in heaven. Uh, he was considered sometimes, he's even called the brother of Christ or the brother of Michael. He's called, you know, this high, high level angel. So why is he only an angel? And when they say angel, they mean all nine ranks of the hierarchy. So when they say the angelic hosts, that goes all the way up to the highest seraphim, the beings of love, all the way down to the angels. Well, Lucifer, when you say Luciferic hosts, you're talking about any of those beings who stayed behind in time to either donate, sacrifice, or selfishly stayed behind. But those who donated and sacrificed are good beings. Without them, we wouldn't have minerals. We wouldn't have plants. We wouldn't have animals. And without the beings who donated human beings and our ego, that we wouldn't exist. So when you say Lucifer, it's strange because you're saying the angels, but you're also saying the highest of the angelic hosts. So when the Luciferic angels fell, it's at every level. For instance, a human can fall. A human can fall from their rank as the 10th hierarchy and go back to being, in, or not go back to being, they can fall into the realm of the angel, uh, animals, excuse me. But when you say Araman, Araman is in, not your, Lucifer's in the astral body, Araman's in the etheric body. And Araman fell and was a laggard being. I have to use Steiner's terms, there's no other way to do this. Lucifer fell during old Saturn. Araman fell during old sun. And a being that in my entire training in anthroposophy, this word was never said out loud. And when I had asked a question about it, the anthroposophist would run away. And that's the word asuras, because you can't find 10 anthroposophists who can tell you what an asura is, because you'd have to give multiple definitions, as John pointed out, depending on whether you're an old Saturn, old sun, old moon, earth, it's quite different. So Araman fell in that second incarnation of the earth during sun, old sun, and the asuras fell during the moon, excuse me, well, uh, yes, the asuras go all the way back to being Archi, excuse me, who fell in the old Saturn. Araman were archangels who fell in old sun. And uh, Lucifer on the moon were angels who fell on the old moon. But it also can literally be reversed because Asuras are Aramonic beings. So if the Asuras fell in ancient times, they were also Aramonic. So that's why this is such a complicated topic, and we had to write a book to make sure to clarify it in Rudolf Steiner's words so that you can read it and you can make your own determinations about these things because some of these questions can be debated, but both sides may be actually correct in the debate. Yeah, it's and it's uh, further uh, complicated because 
when you're saying the word aramonic, what you're using it, uh, it's you're not using it as an, a name, you know, you're using it as, as a classification of an order of beings, just like with the Luciferic beings and the Luciferic angels that Rudolf Steiner talks about. But yet, Lucifer uh, went through uh, an incarnation as an art in the through his human stage, which would would be the old sun period, which is the human stage of what now are archangels. I know it's confusing, but their their human stage was on old sun at the same time that uh, that and when there's that reference to the the brother of Christ, it's reference to that old sun designation. But that's Lucifer, the leader of the Luciferic coast, of which are retarded beings from the following uh, cycle of old moon, okay, which corresponds to the angelic host. So you get that kind of uh, a complication, but he does give a very specific designation uh, in Wonders of the World lecture series that I like to reference often, where he talks about Lucifer being uh, tied to the planet Venus. And so you see, when you look in the characteristics of Lucifer, it's that prideful impulse. And, and within that prideful impulse is that, you know, I, you know, like, like that quote said that, you know, I don't have to follow the rules. I can just do whatever I want to do. So that's that Prometheus impulse, which there's a, a good side to that because that's how we obtain our freedom. But the, the uh, unrelenting expression of that, it results in egoism. And, and that's something that Rudolf Steiner pointed very specifically as being uh, the modern dilemma. You know, as soon as we start talking, it just becomes so complicated to try to explain this to people because it, literally after 40 years of studying this together, there are still things that when you hear them, you go, I don't know exactly what that means. I have to think about it for another decade or two. You know, uh, for instance, uh, Enrico Dandola, Rudolf Steiner said, was inspired by Araman before Araman took on his physical form which we're going to talk about extensively in this uh, talk and the next one, uh, because supposedly Araman, according to many, is incarnated now in America. And we'll give you the quotes are in the book and we'll go over some of those. But the deal is, is that as you're working on these things, you have to figure out how it's important to you. So though John and I are cosmologists and we want to know in great detail exactly what happened in these ancient periods, others would say, well, what does that have to do with the modern time? Well, why would Rudolf Steiner choose the name Araman for this being who he says is the being that we are fighting the most with in our time? Now, he's not the one who's going to annihilate the soul, because in the title it's the occult annihilation of the soul, or soul and spirit. So are there beings who wish to annihilate the soul? Yeah, that's Araman. But the Asuras literally, because they work in the physical body, eat your ego, eat your I am. So when the Asuras take a bite out of you, you don't get it back. And if they take enough bites out of you, you're no longer human and you literally are annihilated. And this is what Araman wants to have happen. So let's characterize a bit these uh, three different forces. And remember that there's also another being here that we haven't mentioned, which is mentioned in the book, The Incarnations of Araman. In the end, it's a whole section on Sorat, Sorath or Sorat, 666, the being who does incarnate by influence every 666 years and sometimes overshadows people, but he hasn't incarnated. Lucifer incarnated in China, in ancient China. Rudolf Steiner says... <laughs> and there's the way that they refer to this. I may have to have John explain this to people because I can tell you that some anthroposophists will get into big arguments about this because they don't understand what a millennium is. Okay. So when you say third millennium BC, first millennium BC is from the birth of Christ to a thousand BC. Second millennium is from 1,000 to 2,000. Third millennium is from any time from 2001 BC going back. 
So when Steiner says and talks about the references of Lucifer incarnating in China and Araman incarnating in America, uh, and he uses four different references about Araman in America, he's basically saying third millennium BC, third millennium AD, okay? Some people believe that that is absolutely quite literal. And the reason that happened is because Lucifer incarnated ahead of time to help human beings have the ability to create images in their mind, what we call concepts, mental images. And basically, since perception, con uh, things that are reflected from the heart in the brain and create concepts, we wouldn't have any concepts. Humans uh, weren't mathematicians. They went into abstract thinking in the far past. So without Lucifer, we wouldn't have the capacity to think. But if Lucifer has his way, he'll draw you out of your body into your thinking until you don't eat or drink. You just sit there and do nothing and you become psychotic. That's what our Lucifer would like to do to you. He would like to draw you up into the clouds where nothing is real, where he convinces you that he is the great being of light. And this is the Luciferic delusion. Araman, on the other hand, is a true being of darkness, and he will try, he basically revels over things like fear, death, illness, hatred. He revels over those because they can annihilate the soul. And so when we're talking about Araman, first off, Lucifer and the astral body, if you tame your astral body, you're taming the dragon of Lucifer. And that's the reason Lucifer, Satan, sometimes referred to as a dragon. If you tame your etheric body where you'll find Araman, then you need to have healthy rhythms in your life. You need to have clear thinking. You need to work out of love. You need to have light in your thinking, and that light can dispel the darkness. But in our age, right now, we have uh, other books coming out, one soon called Surviving the Apocalypse. Ask anybody who's a Christian or in the Western world, and they'll tell you, oh, yeah, we're in the apocalypse. I'd say probably 90% of the people would say, we absolutely are in the apocalypse beyond a shadow of a doubt. And so what are you supposed to do in the apocalypse? You're supposed to defeat the dragon with seven heads and 10 horns that rises out of the sea. That's Araman. Now, Araman started really to have control of this realm down here, particularly in relationship to humans in 1840, when he basically came down to the earth and because of uh, printing, because of books, because of um, the steam engine, because of um, all modern inventions, all machines, this is the realm of Araman. And in the West, if we admit it, almost all of our thinking is derived from our Aramonic materialistic perspective. As a matter of fact, if you wanted to give science a name, you'd have to call it materialistic, secular humanism, because they don't believe in God. They only believe in humans and only humans while they're alive. And it's secular because it's really a religion. Science, materialistic science is a religion. You believe it. You don't know it. You didn't do the experiments to create those theories. And most theories are supplanted every hundred years. So Araman, Rudolf Steiner said the danger of Araman would be that he would get control of human thinking and make it completely materialistic. Well, why is that a danger? Because then you don't believe in Christ. You don't believe in life after death. You don't believe in life before birth. You don't believe that after you die, you go somewhere significant that's spiritual instead of just cold, dark grave. Araman is here to convince us that that's it. So on the left-hand side, whispering in your ear is one demon saying, oh, ignore everybody else. Just be selfish. Just realize that you are God. You are the divine light. You are all there is. You are God. And that's what Lucifer tells you. And these are the temp same temptations that Christ was put through in the desert. Araman, on the other hand, says, there's no God. There's no Christ. Don't be silly. There's only material things. And if you're going to only live one life, then you better be greedy, get all you can, and live as long as you can. And no matter how many people you have to step on, climb that ladder of materialism. Unfortunately, that's the religious beliefs of most, most Westerners, even if they think to believe in Christ. Because what's the other tool that Araman uses? 
He says, the Christian gospels, the New Testament, are literal. Steiner spoke frequently about that. If we start to believe that the gospels are literal, we will take Christ out of the New Testament. And at that point, you won't get him back because he will become a myth. He will become just a historical anomaly. He will become nothing more than a legend. And so Araman, Lucifer is bold and in your face every time you think, but Araman sneaks in and starts to subsume your willpower by every time you pick up one of these. You know, there are people who don't who don't call anybody. They have to text because calling might mean a human interaction and Araman wouldn't like that. So you hear the anthroposophist all the time saying, this is Aramonic. The computers are harmonic. The steam engine, cars, airplanes, they're all harmonic. And the, 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 the problem there is if you try to run away from Lucifer and Araman, they just go and get other people. So if you can deny them and act as if they don't exist, it just means you sick them on other people. You, you, you sent them out like the Essenes did. Rudolf Steiner described that. Lucifer and Armand would come to the gates of the Essene community. They couldn't come in. So where would they go? Back out into the community. And so the Essenes were responsible for basically potentizing, strengthening Lucifer and Armand. In our day, we must become conscious of them. And I used to think, as John knows full well, because I was in the NSA and I got too involved in machines. And I said, I'm never going to work on these machines again. I'm never going to co program computers and I'm going to sneak into Araman's camp, and I'm going to be his lieutenant. And one day, I'm going to slip him a mickey. I'm going to poison him. I'm going to kill him. And then I've done my job, right? No. Opposite of what you need to do. You need to slip into the belly of the dragon, and you need to work from the inside out. And that's what my dear Tyler did right here. See that? On this book, you see that? That's evil. That's Aramon. That's 666. These are encoded in groups of uh, six at the beginning of each three, three sections. And this is a sigil that we created that creates basically love, more or less. And we put it in there. So every time one of these books has to be printed through Amazon, guess what? Aramon has to kiss a sigil. And uh, we get to laugh at Aramon because as John pointed out to me this morning, the worst thing that a demon hates, does that work? Demons hate being mocked, laughing at them and saying, I'm a human, you're a demon, get behind me, you have no power and control over me. Well, that's what you do to Lucifer, Araman, the Asuras and Soroth, because Christ is in you and you have the power over them. Yes, uh, Rudolf Steiner is very clear. He says that Christ is infinitely more powerful than the adversaries. So that kind of sums it up. And it's interesting because if you look at the, the stages of uh, Rudolf Steiner's cosmology with old Saturn, old sun, old moon, and then we're on Earth right now, you have this amazing, uh, highly developed and specialized cosmology in which it enables you to think about things that are not uh, sense bound. And Rudolf Steiner said that uh, what mankind in this current time period needs to do is to be able to take uh, their ideas and bring them to the level of moral imagination, to bring them into the realm of being able to picture that that all the things that we have uh, that are encased in letters, that all of that, when you cross the threshold at the end of your life, uh, they don't play into it. What plays into it is how you surrounded it with your own uh, relationship to the word, to the logos. So, which is, you know, the, so you have a uh, moral imagination is the brow chakra, the two petal lotus, and then you have the uh, 16 petal lotus of the throat chakra, which relates to the etheric. So you have astral etheric, and then you have that heart chakra, which is the 12 petal lotus. And he says that if you can 
develop your relationship to these centers, it goes in stages, is that to be able to uh, enter into the brow enables you to go back in, in time, so to speak, figuratively, and to go back to the throat. So with this, uh, with the brow, you can go back to before you were born. And with the throat, you can go back to the uh, earlier stages and incarnations of, of your lives. But if, if you go all the way to the, the third stage, the, the realm of intuition, that you can go back all the way to these old Saturn, old sun, and old moon conditions that Rudolf Steiner talks about, where the prototypes for your current vehicles were manifested by higher beings. So the old prototypal physical is old Saturn, the prototype etheric body is old sun and the prototype astral body is old moon. And then you have the current earth where we're going through our human incarnations. Yes, you know, when you say Araman nowadays, a lot of people know that name, but they might not know where it came from. So let me explain that a bit. In ancient Persia, when they were working on... Um, Basically, the forces of light and dark, where it was a polarity between the being of the sun coming in the rays of the sun called Ahura Mazdeo, and then the forces of darkness, living forces of darkness called Angri Manu, or as also called Araman. So it's an ancient Persian god, but it's a god of polarities. And it's uh, something that in the future we will understand better. And one can look at Monarchism, which is a religion that combined Christianity, uh, Hinduism, and a few other religions in a, a, a syncretic religion where basically he broke it down to saying it's a battle between light and dark, period. But Christ hadn't come to the earth yet. He hadn't incarnated. This was beforehand. So this is uh, the ancient Persian period, not the Persian period that we know in history, but even before that. And so the being who led that culture was called Zarathustra or, uh, uh, or Zoroaster. So why did Steiner grab a demon name from the ancient Zoroastrians? Because it depicted what is going to be in the future when after the war of all against all, and there is a time after the war of against all, all as a matter of fact, in the next book we're going to be talking about, John and I labored long and hard to try to bring you the most accurate version of Steiner's cosmology that you can find anywhere because there are so many, a variety of terms used for the things that it even confuses the, the best and the greatest anthroposophists. Unless you sit down with somebody where two or more are gathered and you work through this for 40 years as John and I have done, and then you can actually figure out the nomenclature, you can figure out these things and you can understand what is about to happen in the future. So there is the war of all against all in about eight, uh, well, it's in the, it's in the future, 6,000 years, but then there's one 31,000 years after that. So we have to remember that the egoism of Lucifer, which is then driven by the seven deadly sins of, uh, you know, the other seven deadly sins of Araman, Araman will try to convince you that really the battle is already over and that there should be no battle and that there is no future. So if you start to listen to these kind of um, religious beliefs coming out of modern science, then you fall into materialism. You fall into what Steiner says is Araman. And since 1840, we have fallen into that so that we believe scientific theories though they're nothing more than guesses and opinions, which in every single case that I know of, there is no theory that's lasted for more than 100 years. But they call it settled science. So who is this that keeps lying? That's Araman. He's the father of lies. But so is Lucifer. He's the father of lies. But Araman is the father that wants to bring you down into absolute nothingness. So why is it that we are facing this Aramonic being? And why is it it's popping up all over the place? Because in the future... It will be a clear battle between good and evil, but good for the people who will be harvested by Christ, called the remnant, the good people 
will actually be able to confront evil and defeat it. But that isn't for a long time. So in the moment, what we need to do is just understand it. So who is this being Ahriman? Well, you can find that Ralph Waldo Emerson, who Rudolf Steiner said was America's anthroposophist without having Steiner's anthroposophy, and the transcendentalists would lead us in the direction of what spiritual science would become in America. Well, if you read Emerson, you're going to hear him refer to Ahriman, A. H-R-I-M-A-N, the exact form that Steiner used, and he used it before Steiner used it. And what did he say? He'd say, I'm getting old, Araman's getting to me, or my back hurts today, Araman's getting to me, or this stupid machine won't work because Araman isn't letting it. Or So he made many, 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 many references in his personal life to Araman. Well, other people, matter of fact, you can see it in a variety of television shows, uh, the Highlander, in the end, who's the ultimate evil he had to fight? Araman. He literally had to fight Araman and Soroth, and they use, literally use those names. So there's Anthroposophus thick in all these different movies, as you all well know. I was involved with Star Wars. I'm sure there's Anthroposophus who evolved in Star Trek. There's Anthroposophus involved in anything. For instance, I someone said on to me, uh, you know, your name of your book the incarnation of Araman, the occult annihilation of the soul, was mentioned in the last uh, movie of King Kong, uh, Godzilla versus King Kong. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Why would that be in there? So I watched it to see. There it is in the background. The only title of any book mentioned is The Incarnation of Araman. So the people who wrote that planted that there. Now you have people who are think they're the greatest anthroposophists in the world who write about these things. And what are you going to find? Every one of them disagrees. They all talk about Araman as if they know him. Matter of fact, I shouldn't mention names, but I'm going to. Robert Powell said in one of his books that Obama was Araman. That is, of course, not true. Terry Boardman said in an article, and now I believe it's gotten into his new book, that he has figured out the exact time that Araman incarnated in America because of astrology. Yeah, well, that's not going to work out too well. Uh, but then you have a variety of people. You have uh, uh, Von Manen, uh, what's his first name? Um, he wrote a book about this. You have uh, all kind, uh, all these people. There's at least a dozen books that will make references to Araman's incarnation because it's the hottest topic there is. How are you going to face the evil that you find all around you? Who is that evil? Where did it come from? What's it? What? Is that evil personal? Like John mentioned, Araman leads the Aramonic beings. Well, the Aramonic beings were around long before Araman incarnated here, probably now in America, uh, or it could be Canada, in North America, Rudolf Steiner said. So you have to understand their biography. You have to understand how they impact you. You have to understand their power over you and the power you have over them. Now, the power they have over you is because you have agreed to it. You have to be a willing subject of a demon or a devil for them to actually obsess or possess you. That's just a fact. You cannot, Christ did not make us vulnerable and put us down into the realm of what people call the prince of darkness. That's a name for Armand. We are born into our, to our father, the prince of darkness. That phrase, that's Armand. That's not Lucifer. Lucifer doesn't want to be on the earth. He wants to be above it. Armon wants to be under the earth. So when these people start talking about all these things, it is absolutely hysterical to me until I realized that on the internet, on Facebook, people were so confused about this that they would say ridiculous things about the Asuras, about Saroth, about the Antichrist, about Armon's incarnation, about the eighth sphere. They love to talk about the eighth sphere. Don't know anybody who understands it. We happen to put it in this book. So if you want to understand the eighth sphere, you can get a full understanding of it in this book or any of those demons that I've just described. But do we really want to deal with demons? Unfortunately, we have to deal with demons because as Rudolf Steiner said, we all have those demons in us. So if you don't know who they are, you can't stop their influence. Yes, and an important consideration. If you go back to uh, the uh, idea of, of the cosmological sequence, Rudolf Steiner is very clear. He says, in order for 
uh, creation to arise, it has to have an opposition. So you have the divine spiritual beings that brought about uh, the manifestation of creation. And he says that the adversarial beings are, are not in, in the same way because they're, they're composed of ideas from the divine spiritual beings that they didn't accept the substance of the divine spiritual beings. And so it makes them different from a human being, for example, because the human being, according to Rudolf Steiner, has received the divine uh, essence from the logos, from Christ, that, that through Christ incarnating on earth, he's the only uh, member of the divine spiritual beings from the upper levels of that to incarnate in the human body. Okay, and that's a, a very important point. But yet he says that, that Lucifer incarnated in China uh, a couple thousand years ago or thereabouts, and, and that Araman was going to incarnate around this time or, or there, shortly thereafter uh, in the West. But when you're talking about the distinction there, you have to see that there's this divine substance that's the core of our being, the, the greater I am, of which our lesser or smaller I am is a part of, that we, we share in that. And so when Christ says, whenever two or more are gathered in my name, then I am in the midst of them, because there's a conjoining together through uh, the company of beings. That, that, that when there's more beings involved that share in that Christ impulse, that, that brings it into a, a, a greater level of manifestation. But whereas these adversarial beings, because they didn't accept the divine spiritual beings' intents, that they are, are ideas of the divine spiritual beings. That's an important point to make, because going back to what I had said earlier, where Rudolf Steiner said Christ is infinitely more powerful than the adversaries, that gives it a, a much uh, greater context. Absolutely, and you brought up at the key point, what is evil? Evil is evil for a time. That's a quote from Rudolf Steiner, only for a time. They have a job to do, and that's to create resistance so that we can come into our own I am, into our own ego consciousness, our own individualized uh, ability to recognize our own thinking, thinking about thinking, your I am. So evil is there to run up against. It's like a wall. And when you run up against it, you go, oh, this is the limit of where I should go, either towards Lucifer, out of your body, towards Araman, too far into your body. And so evil itself will be redeemed. Now, very subtle point. But if you don't know this, then you really cannot have a true perspective of what this is about. It used to be that we would get very confused in our training, you know, and we had these great anthroposophical teachers and we'd ask them these difficult questions and they would, they, if they couldn't answer it, they'd say, I don't believe your karma is ripe enough that I should tell you that. In other words, they don't know. Okay, that's what they were telling you. Here's the reality. Lucifer, yeah, it's on your right hand, Lucifer, and the Lucifer beings on your left hand. I'm sorry, Araman on your right hand. But who's in the middle? Those are the Asura beings. But why? Because the Asuras are now acting as Aramonic beings of materialism. And some of this materialistic stuff can eat your ego. For instance, this is the cause of more teenage suicides than anything else in history. Right here. Okay, now if you don't realize that it's evil, then you shouldn't be using it because it's going to take advantage of you. If you know it's evil, you'd like my wife. She can't find her phone most of the time, uh, and and I'd call it, but I can't find mine almost all the time. Because why? I don't want to be anywhere near it. When I sleep at night, I put Shungite on top of it and put it so far, far away from me. So if you know they're evil, and then you use it and you thank those beings, thank you, Araman. And thank you, millions of programmers who created this thing that's in my hand that makes me look like I'm uh, omnipotent, omnipresent, and omni omniscient. Thank you so much. But you know what, Arman? I am not quite, yeah, there's Shungite. I'm not going to let you get to me. And by the way, when I'm looking on this, 
and I'm looking at all those crazy pictures. I just, I'm, I'm real old fashioned. I don't do much technology, but now on Facebook, they have, um, is it on Facebook? Yeah. They have things called reels, which are little like TikTok, two minute things. Right. And it's the most incredible, crazy things ever been filmed in human history. You can get on that and never get off. And I'm not kidding. It's like the first time I got on the internet and started surfing the internet. Holy cow, I got to go to all these ancient documents that I've been wanting to read. And I got to, do, you know, I could go look at places I've always wanted to be or go look at places I've been. Holy moly, I was 100% addicted. And, and I looked at myself and said, you're addicted. And I said, yeah, I know. And I like it. It's really great. That's what this can do. And literally, there are children who only watch TikTok day in, day out. Even if they're walking down the street and the car runs into them, last thing they're going to remember is the last two-minute TikTok they were just looking at. So that's Lucifer. What it, Lucifer's light. It's color. It's showy. It's glamour. It's astral light. It's all this stuff you're supposed to be going in the opposite direction of. You're supposed to have imagination in your mind. You're supposed to create images that you control with love from your heart. But no, no, no. Lucifer is going to give you just images after images after images. And they may mean nothing. Araman, on the other hand, oh, Araman knows that all of us want to ascend and go back to heaven where we came from if we're pure in our heart. Rudolf Steiner says that Araman is going to create a school basically of clairvoyance for the modern age. It's already happened. There's devices. That's what the e-machine is. I'm not going to say who, who uses the e-machine, but that's what the e-machine does. That's what all these different machines do. They make you think you're clairvoyant when you're going insane, actually. And they luciferically think that you know the future, that you're this high spiritual being, blah, blah. It's all a harmonic delusion. So Rudolf Steiner's open mysteries are for everyone. That's why this is a self-initiation path. You don't need anybody else. You can do the work yourself. Araman, if you get into his, it's going to be totally mechanical. Now, can they do these things? Yes. They can read your thoughts with the machine. They can implant thoughts with the machine uh, through um, MRIs, uh, functional MRIs. They can broadcast it through 5G. They can broadcast images into your mind. They have figured out what images look, do in your brain, and they can record it, and they can control that. That is Araman's school of clairvoyance. So Lucifer on one hand is going to delude you. Araman on the other hand is going to tempt you into thinking that you're all that. But in the middle, the future holds after evil comes to rule because of human egotism that creates the war of all against all. After that, after we actually have our real ego, our spiritual ego, and the others who are going the opposite direction are losing their ego and becoming human animals or animal humans, we have to realize that in the future, there's even worse evil coming, and that is Soroth. Soroth is a being who lives on the sun. He's the antichrist. He's the anti-logos. He's the anti everything that Christ is doing for us, the anti-ego, the anti-I am, and he has yet to incarnate in the physical body. Araman is doing it now. Lucifer did it a long time ago. Soroth does it into, in the far future. But if things keep going as bad as they are going, where evil is, is now not hiding anymore, Araman doesn't try to hide and overwhelm you. He's in your face. He wants you to get a, a new 5G, a new 6G. He wants you to get the new computer. He wants you to be lose yourself in the black box. And where is that? That's subnature. That's a realm of darkness. Inside of these computers is another realm that is not human. It's inhuman, in fact. But Saurat is the, is the leader of that. Saurat wants to annihilate Christ and Christ's work on the earth. In other words, every sing, single human being, wipe out the earth, wipe out human evolution. Rudolf Steiner said that at the turn of this last millennium in 2000 AD, that we would have the possibility to speed up evolution and unfortunately, get to the war of all against all 6,000 years too early, or even to the sect, to the annihilation of the earth, where it's transformed, it's not just an annihilation, that we could get to that early. And that would make Sorat happy. And then Sorat would come from the sun and come down to the earth. But right now, 
what we're worried about is the following. And you tell me if this isn't already happening. Rudolf Steiner said that the being of materialism that started machines and printing and all these things back in 1840, all those beings prepared for, the, for their leader, Araman himself, to incarnate in a human body physically. And what does he want to do? He wishes to stay on the earth permanently inside of a machine. Now, how many of you know that there are churches right now in America that worship super AI? And they believe, and they arrived on this on their own, that the being of machines is going to incarnate into a human being, and that human being is going to incarnate in the machines, and then that's going to cause the machines to be highly advanced and become a super AI. And this religion says, we can't wait for that to happen because then we won't have to make any decisions. We'll let the machines, the super AI, the super artificial intelligence make all our decisions for us. And what is that? That's the internet, of course. And is, has it happened that there's a being who can incarnate in the internet? Is not Elon Musk trying to put a chip in, in the heads of monkeys and humans as soon as possible so they can have permanent connection to the internet? Do they not have wet works already? They already have very advanced military wet works that your brain, they put a chip in your brain and it can control a robot or can control machines outside of yourself. So there are people who are saying that they're able to take human memory and store it. And now they're believing that they can take all of the memory in your brain, which isn't really where your memory is. And that's how confused they are. And they can put it into a machine and that machine is going to be able to hold it permanently. So Araman wants to never die. Lucifer wanted to never die too when he was in China, by the way, but he didn't get his wish. We'll talk about that in the next show. But Araman wants to live forever in a machine and control all humans and lead humans into, as we've described, the cold, dead grave after death. Well, yeah, if you just go to uh, the professor of the Department of History at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, uh, uh, Yuval Noah Harari, who's the leading advisor to Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum. He says, and this is a quote, I strongly believe that given the technologies we are now developing, within a century or two at most, our species will disappear. I don't think that in the end of the 20th second century, the earth will still be dominated by homo sapiens. So, I mean, that's really, uh, uh, he, I mean, he's not hiding, you know, and so you have this whole idea that arises. And there's these two fundamental uh, modalities that Rudolf Steiner talks about, where he talks about that which arises, uh, uh, monism, that, that there's this one principle of all things you know they always want the theory of everything right and the, and you also have from it the monotheistic uh, religions that arose through the various uh semitic cultures but that Rudolf Steiner says in other cultures it was a polytheistic uh, so it's actually a monadism rather than the monism and that there's the the all the various company of beings that are involved in creation. He says, but you need both, you see? And so you have a focusing in the Old Testament where they, you know, cut out, you know, no graven images and all of that. And there, there's a reason why that occurred so that it would bring us into incarnation to where we could think abstractly. And, and if you look at, at Abraham, he was, he was good at with uh, math, basically, and to be able to deal with uh, concepts arising from the world of the senses. He wasn't receiving inspiration from super sensible beings controlling his thoughts, that he was bringing us into that world that now has evolved to the point to where there are a large company of people that think that that's the only world there is and all this other stuff that we're talking about with all these spirits and all that's a bunch of nonsense. So that's your materialistic scientists who are looking for a theory of everything. And it's uh, akin to, you could call it kind of an atheistic form of monotheism, essentially. 
And so there's a certain vulnerability that is when you don't have the cosmology to be able to es express uh, clear images of what these evils are represented as. And so if you go to scripture, for example, you have the, the temptations in the desert. And so you have Rudolf Steiner pointing out that there's a temptation of Lucifer, you know, wanting uh, Jesus to proclaim himself king of the world. And then you have the uh, temptation, which was Lucifer and Araman. And then you have the temptation uh, turning the stones into bread. And that is Araman by himself. So there's three temptations, Lucifer, Lucifer, and Araman, and then Araman. And it's important to be able to make that distinction because uh, your basic fundamentalists will, they'll use those words interchangeably as if they're talking about the same being. And because of that, they're in this kind of dualistic, good, evil drama Whereas Rudolf Steiner says that the, the key to understanding the uh, Christ impulse is that it's a harmonization, it's a balancing. And so if you look at the representative of humanity statue that Rudolf Steiner worked on at the end of his life, you have Lucifer and Araman with Christ holding the balance between these beings. And furthermore, up at the very top, there's the spirit of mirth. Demons don't like jokes, especially when they're the brunt of the joke. So I love every time I meet a demon to make fun of them. And But really, you have to know them well. You have to know their biography. And then you literally can say, really, Lucifer? You think I'm going to fall for that? I still have feet. I know you don't, but I have feet. And I don't need your wings because my brain can fly into the higher world. And he gets so mad when you say things like that to him that he'll actually leave. Now, Harari pure evil. He says we're hackable animals. He says that the homo sapien, where that, let's remember, what does homo sapien mean? It means human full of wisdom. Sapientia means wisdom. And so what do you have? Homo sapien. He says, no, we're going to be homo. Uh, he has a special name for it, but basically a technocrat. We're going to be technology. We're going to be part, we're going to be transhuman. So might as well say homo transhuman. Now, what did Steiner call his spiritual science? Anthropo, Sophia. Anthropo means human. Sophia means wisdom. It's the same thing. So homo sapiens are the same thing as an anthroposophist or anthroposophia, Sophia wisdom. And so that's what we're trying to work on. We need to not change and not be a homo sapien anymore. We need to be a real homo sapien who gets the wisdom. And it isn't through technology. And so when it comes down to it, in the old days, about this time, this is when John and I order another pot of coffee, and then we start on the second level of what we're going to dive into on any particular topic. And that's what we're going to do in the next video we're going to do. But I want to thank you, John, because, you know, what you've brought here, the last statement you just said, it's all about that. It's all about balance. You can balance every demon there is, and you can also balance all the angels. We have the capacity as co-creators, divine co-creators, to be able to manage these things in a way that it turns out for good. So that's the message we're trying to tell you, that if you're going to read this book, The Incarnation of Armin, don't get scared, get motivated.